Welcome to the Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. My name is Dr. Adriana Popescu. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and leader in the field of mental health, energy psychology, addiction, trauma, and empowerment. In this podcast, we will be exploring mental health from a variety of perspectives, from the spiritual to the shamanic and beyond. What if mental illness isn't everything we think it is? What if everything we see as a pathology is actually a possibility? What else is possible with mental health? Hi everyone, Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you today with another episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. And I'm really excited to have as my guest with me today, Mary Beth O'Connor. She is someone who has been sober since 1994. She is also in recovery from abuse, trauma, PTSD, and anxiety. Her story is chronicled in her memoir, From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. She's had essays in such publications as the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, and Recovery Today. Mary Beth is a director for the She Recovers Foundation and Life Ring Secular Recovery. She regularly speaks on behalf of these organizations and about multiple and secular paths to recovery. She develops relationships with other organizations, such as Women for Sobriety, and Mary Beth trains attorneys and medical professionals about substance use disorder and recovery. Six years into her recovery, Mary Beth attended Berkeley Law. She worked at a large firm, then litigated class actions for the federal government. In 2014, she was appointed a federal administrative law judge, from which position she retired in early 2020. That's so many interesting things in your life. Welcome, Mary Beth. Glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. I always start off the show with asking the guests to tell us a little bit about themselves, about their journey, and how you came to be doing this wonderful work that you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, so the the title to the book references the trauma and substance use disorder, and, and I really do like to talk about them in combination because I think it's underappreciated how direct of a line there is from trauma and abuse into, into developing a substance mm -hmm. use disorder. And so for me, it really was from the beginning, not a great situation. My mother wasn't really connected to me. I mean, the first six months of my life, I lived at a nunnery and later for three years with a great grandmother. Um, and my mother could be violent, but things got a lot worse when I was nine and she married my stepfather and he was very violent with her. He was physically and sexually violent with me. And it was just that kind of household where you never knew what was going to happen. And it was very high stress. And so I picked up drugs early. Um, alcohol was my first drug. Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I progressed really fast and I was using meth, uh, methamphetamine by 16, shooting up by 17 in full bore addiction in high school. And that was a direct reaction to, you know, this at first seemed to be a solution to my pain, to my anxiety. It seemed to make me feel better and improve things. But of course, you know, when you develop a substance use disorder, that part doesn't last long and it becomes its own bigger problem. And I actually didn't get sober till I was 32. So it was a really long haul for me. Yeah. And when you first tried to get sober, I mean, what were you trying to do it on your own? Did you get treatment? Were you having any kind of support with that process? So I went in inpatient. It was a women's program, a 90 day minimum. So it was a longer term program, although I ended up staying five months. And, you know, in my mind, I was going in for medical treatment, but it really was a 12 step house. You know, 12 steps is Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, mm -hmm. all the anonymouses, um, which, which is a good program for a lot of people, but was a really terrible fit for me. And so but the problem was that they told me that's all there was, that there was no other way. I mean, they literally told me you must comply with all of this or you're going yep. to fail. And it, even when I told them why it wouldn't work, they wouldn't listen. Um, and so it was a big, a real problem. But luckily, when I got home and I, I'll emphasize for the younger people, it's 1994 and there's no Google. Okay, <laughs> so I went to the library 
<laughs> to see if there were other options. <laughs> Got my car and drove to the library. Um, and it turned out even in 94, there were. And so I attended other programs, which I'm happy to talk about. And I, I ended up really combining ideas from multiple sources and sort of building an individual plan that worked for me. And I didn't know anybody who did it then, but today we would call it a hybrid or patchwork plan. And then I also started working on the trauma. So that's really the foundation. of Yeah. And I think people don't quite understand that there is no one size fits all for recovery. Different things are going to work for different people, um, including length of stay and, and what kind of program, if you go to a treatment program, what kind you go to. I know back in those days, um, you know, we were just starting to get on board with uh, treatment programs, including the mental health side. We have a healthcare system that's very fragmented, even now, um, that yeah. treats substance abuse and mental health separately. There are different payment sources. There are even different licensing. I know because I'm the clinical director at a drug and alcohol rehab. Um, and we also have a mental health program we've now started. And they're separate. Even the state, the way it licenses the two programs is completely different departments. And so We've had this fragmented treatment system where people who have co-occurring mental health disorders, like what you were saying, um, uh, PTSD, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, or um, any kind of depression, anxiety, you know, if it's something more uh, psychotic, like schizophrenia, like these things typically have not been treated together with the substance use disorder, you would go to one program for one thing and then go to another program for another. And that just doesn't make sense because those two are not separate. Can, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good point because when I was in rehab, they actually told us that they wouldn't even evaluate us for mental health for 90 days until we got the drugs out of our system, which today we know that is not the no. right answer. <laughs> um, today, you know, the best practices is that if you go in for substance use disorder treatment, you should be evaluated right away for other mental health disorders. And I did, I had PTSD. I had severe anxiety. I didn't even know I had PTSD. I didn't know you could have PTSD unless you were a war veteran. I mean, and that was the um, the limit of my knowledge, um, but but when I got home, I did understand that my trauma was connected to my substances, and so I did get a therapist, private therapy, with somebody who had trauma expertise and some substance expertise. So I understood the connection. I didn't understand the depth of the connection, the nuances of the connection, or how much my recovery would interplay, but I didn't understand there was a connection. Yeah. Um, and I will say also that for me, my substance recovery was much faster than my trauma recovery because my trauma was older and more complicated. Yes. And so I really had my substances under control within two and a half to three years, but I was in some version of therapy for my mental health for over 10 years. And, you know, and even now I say I'm mostly recovered, you know, depending on the day, 92 to 95%, it's still there a little, uh, but there's definitely that interplay between developing the substance use disorder, but also in your Yeah. Recovery. And people still, even now in 2023, don't totally get that connection. There are still programs out there that are not addressing mental health, that do not have a psychiatrist or medical provider um, for the mental health side of things. You have programs that are still 12-step dominated and not necessarily even using like medication-assisted therapies, you know, like methadone, suboxone, um, you know, things that we, in, in this day and age, the science tells us is, is really helpful for some folks who are trying to get off these substances. Um, and, you know, another misnomer, uh, I've been in the field working a long, long time. And another misnomer for, for forever, and I think still is, is out there in some circles, is this idea that you don't touch the trauma until the person has a certain period of time sober. Like, don't even open up Pandora's box because, you know, you could trigger someone to relapse. But the reality is, especially where I work, where it's a women's program specifically for co-occurring disorders and trauma, these ladies can't get you know, six months to a year yeah. sober to be able to do the trauma work then, like we have to do it up front from the beginning because uh, so many people are self-medicating the symptoms of that trauma with the drugs and alcohol. 
Well, well, I, that's, that's right. I mean, you're absolutely right. That's best practices. But the other thing that I've thought about is I actually tried to get um, uh, therapy when I was still using. And the reality was I could never make progress because it was like a wall between me and myself. Right. And so I didn't even really fully understand my own history, much less be able to access the emotional content to it. Um, but but you're right. I mean, a lot of it's pain, a pain reduction tool, but it, then it covers everything up. And if all of a sudden you're in you and you're expected to stay sober without addressing what is often the root cause, that's not going to um, have good odds of success. And also the truth is, once you stop putting drugs in your system, you know, emotions flood you, sometimes memories flood you, behaviors are, I mean, I didn't understand my own reaction to a lot of things. And so it, it's, if you start addressing it up front to help see the connections, it can make people, um, it, it, I think it increases the odds if the substances are under control, it increases your odds of being able to address your mental health. And if your mental health is starting to be addressed, it helps reduce the need for the substances, right? And so there's that win-win exactly. benefit. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more, you know, about your journey and what you found the most helpful. Um, was there a specific kind of trauma work that you did that you really found was useful for you? In, initially, I did individual work um, with a therapist, and that was helpful. I, did, I tried meds in the beginning, and nothing really worked. But later, there was I, I was on a medication that actually did help for a couple of years. But I will say one of the a real leap forward for me was after about three years of individual therapy, my therapist put me in with um, in a group of a group therapy with women who had a trauma history. And that was so enlightening to me. I mean, it just it left my recovery forward in a new way because they were connecting their current behaviors and their current reactions back to the trauma in ways that I hadn't yet been able to connect it. And so it really helped me see um, the breadth and depth of the impact of the trauma on my way of thinking and on my on my actions and on my reactions. And once I saw it, I could make better progress to address it. You know, it, it, once I understood the, the the link, it was um, it was I was able to be more efficient and more effective yes. at trying. To and address I think it. that really speaks to another myth that I would love to debunk, which is that. Um, people, you know, should, should just get over their trauma. You know, it's in the past. It yeah. happened. You can't change it. Just get over it and move on. So many people get that message, you know, especially in this American culture, we're very much pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, kind of mentality. Um, but it really, um, it, that's not how it works because your body remembers and your subconscious mind remembers and we get these conditioned trauma responses. I think that's what you're referring to, you know, where, uh, you know, a loud sound makes you jump 10 feet in the air, um, where you overreact perhaps emotionally, you know, to different situations where your brain, that fight flight mechanism in your brain goes off, you know, without your control. And then and next thing you know, you're in flashbacks or having re-experiencing, you know, elements of the trauma. People don't really fully understand the scope of how physiological trauma is in addition to it being psychological. And it's not just something you can like snap your fingers and get over. Well, you know, it's funny because I remember my mother was complaining about my sister. Why she needs to get over it, referring to our abusive history. And I looked at her and I said, well, what that's she will benefit if she can resolve this. I said, but one of her abusers does not get to set the time frame. You know, I mean, like how ridiculous that you are saying it's time for her to get over it. Um, but the other reality is one important realization for me in my recovery was recognizing at some point that, you know, the people who they broke me. Right. I mean, they broke me in a lot of ways, but they weren't going to fix me. I really had to take ownership of my recovery. And when I talk to to newcomers and particularly women, one of the things I emphasize is that seeking professional help is a self empowerment decision. Right. I mean, because I'm really all about self-empowered recovery. But if you're looking at where you are and what you need and you're saying, look, I need this help and I go out and I get this help for myself, that is part of self-empowered yes. recovery. And I think that's huge because people, especially with trauma, have been disempowered. Right. Yes. You know, they've lost yes. their sense of power, their sense of control over things. And so it's really easy to stay stuck in a victim kind of consciousness where, um, the drugs, you know, you, you get a case of the efforts and, you know, like I, there's nothing I can do to change the circumstances of my life. So I might as well get high. Right. 
um, or drink or whatever the behavior is. You, you mentioned something I think really important, which I definitely want to delve into more, which is the power of group or groups and group therapy to assist people in recovering both from addiction and mental health issues. Can you say more about the value of that? Because you really devoted a lot of your life to that now. Yeah, and I mean, 30% of my book is about recovery too, because I really wanted to show sort of a more realistic example of how recovery plays out. And not just like at the at the end of a lot of memoirs, it's sort of like I went to a couple of meetings and everything was great. And it's like, well, that's not how recovery works. Um, but yeah, that with that group, um, with the women and that uh, trauma group, uh, group therapy, were, that was very important for me. I certainly did um, group support for my substance use disorder. I went to a lot of meetings. I didn't just do... 12 steps again, because it wasn't the right fit, but I also went to Women for Sobriety. I went to the parent of Life Frame Secular Recovery that I'm on the board for, the parent of Smart Recovery, which is still exists today. Um, and I read all their materials and I went to the support meetings and they had different approaches. I mean, we talk about substance use disorder meetings, it's as if they're all the same and they're not. I mean, the philosophies vary, but the meeting formats also vary a lot. And so what meeting format you're comfortable with or get the most value out of is really what it is. What meeting format do you find the most valuable um, can really there's a wide variety. And so when people look at different options, I always emphasize that. Look at the philosophy. That's important. But look at what the meetings are and try them out. The other thing is that today, She Recovers Foundation that I'm on the board for, She Recovers isn't just for substance recovery. It's also for trauma recovery, mental health, self-harm, other behavioral disorders like eating disorders or shopping um, for overwork. I mean, it's really for everything together because the reality is most women that have a substance use disorder have one or more of these other things they need to work on as well. And so that's a nice place where you can talk about um, the relationship between one or the other. You know, I'm struggling. I'm having an emotional reaction. I was able to not drink, but... You know, I'm struggling with my eating or I'm struggling with something else. And that, that connection that the women understand the overlap and the interplay. And so that can be a really good support. I love that today. because, you know, if you were to stay within the 12 step system, you have to go to a different kind of meeting for each issue, right? Yes. You have to go to your code yes. meetings for your codependency and you have to go to one of the many eating, you know, groups, OA or, you know, um, over, there's a bunch of them now with the food ones, right? So so being able to address all of it in one place for some people might work really, really well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more since you had so much experience with the different programs and philosophies, can you just give us kind of a brief overview for the folks who really don't know much beyond 12 step, like what some of these alternatives are and what they're like? So um, she recovers, which I mentioned the overlap, they're really about, you know, um, taking control and building, becoming your best self, but they're also focused on the mind body connection. So there are yoga meetings and dance meetings. Uh, meditation is a big a part of it. And it's about building the skills to, you know, toward wholeness. Um, uh, life ring secular recovery, they, they're, we call it the three S philosophy. So it's sobriety. Although for life ring, sobriety includes MAT. It includes, if you are taking medication and we always emphasize as prescribed, <laughs> including MAT for us, that counts as sober. And so, and that includes for mental health medications as well, of course. And, um, and then secularity just means no religion in meetings. But a lot of our members have personal religious or spiritual beliefs. It's just not part of our program. And then it's self-empowerment. It's about a personal recovery plan. Life Ring believes that your plan and my plan probably won't be the same because we're different people and we have different priorities and different things we need to work on. And so it's about um, the personal recovery plan and an individual plan. And then Women for Sobriety, they're focused on uh, releasing the past and taking control of your life. In a WFS meeting, you don't use that typical introduction of I'm Mary Beth and I'm an addict. Their introduction is I'm Mary Beth and I'm a competent wow. woman. And that intro right there tells you a lot about the philosophy, right? Um, and then Smart Recovery is um, cognitive behavioral therapy focused and their meeting format's different. They usually have like a topic, like a teaching 
part of the meeting and then talk. Whereas life ring is a hundred percent talk with cross talk, you know, members talk to each other. So there's a lot of variety out and these are just, there are others. I mean, I'm just mentioning some of the larger ones, but there are a lot of options and you can mix and match. I mean, if anybody tells you, you have to make an exclusive commitment to their program, to me, that's a red flag. Yeah. I mean, the thing we always tell our clients, he says, you know, take whatever works for you from whatever program and leave the rest behind. But I think people sometimes, it can get a bit dogmatic, right? Uh, various programs have been guilty of this, where they'll basically say, do it, like you referenced this before, like do it our way 100% or else you're going to relapse. And that's that fear tactic and that, um, sort of mandating people, forcing people into like doing must do this exactly this way. Um, just because it worked for one person doesn't mean that approach is going to work for someone else. Right. And the which other interesting thing is like 12 steps is very structured that way, right? It's very well. And for, for some people, they find the structure helpful, especially in early recovery. Maybe two years later, they want to spread their wings and look at other. On the other hand, for others from the beginning, that kind of structure is a negative, trying to be forced into a one size fits all approach. And so it really is about sort of what's your personality, what's your worldview, what's your learning style. But I always encourage people, whatever one program sounds good, try a couple different meetings. Because the other side of it is that in all the programs, different meetings have different personalities. And so they should, you know, if, if the philosophy looks good, then I would not give up because one meeting wasn't to my liking. Whatever you're looking at, try at least a couple different leaders because they have yes, different styles. Yes, and locations too. Like, uh, the neighborhood or town, or, I mean, they really can be so incredibly diverse, um, just from even one part of town to another part of town. And, and again, yeah, like who are the people that tend to lead that meeting and, and what are they bringing up their own personal stuff to the table that might not be the same somewhere else? Um, cause yeah, too often I've heard clients say, well, I tried it once. I didn't like it. So therefore I'm yeah. never going to go again. <laughs> Let's not be so bad. That's right. Right. <laughs> yeah, give it a little more than that. But it, and it also can depend on like what's the ratio of newcomers to people with long term sobriety. What's you know what's the sort of um, uh, the, just the personality of the of the regulars. What how much of the group are regulars and how much of the group sort of come and go. There's just a lot of different factors that go into sort of that group dynamic. Um, personality factor. And then of course, even 12 steps does have women meeting life ring has women's meetings too. And as do smart. And so uh, sometimes women do feel more comfortable in being in either a woman only program, like she recovers or women for sobriety or else the specific meetings. Yeah, are exactly. And there, um, and I know in 12 step, they have young people meetings too, right? So it can, or it can center mm -hmm. around, um, I remember in Marin County here in, in California, there's one called the other bar, which is for lawyers in recovery, yeah. right? Lawyers. Yeah, exactly. So it can be very specific. Yes. The groups themselves. Um, yeah. And she recovers that things like, that's right. And she recovers as things for um, not just legal professionals, we have it, but for pe people that are caregivers or medical professionals, or of course, you know, uh, people of color, LGBTQIA plus, they pretty much all have meetings for, 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 um, for the, that group. And so, it, yeah, it's important to look at the different options and figure out what's going to work. But the good news is there are a lot of options and there's, and even if these groups, the other groups besides 12 steps, um, aren't face to face in your community because the reality is 12 steps is pretty much everywhere. And that is one of the yeah. benefits of it. Um, but you, they're all the others, they do all have local meetings, but if it's not in your area, you can participate online and that can be a really helpful option. Now we have the internet. And so everyone can access all of the options today, which is really widens the, the world of recovery um, in a really uh, Yeah, I wanted way. to bring that up because especially during the pandemic, I mean, meetings, a, a lot of them, a vast chunk even of 12-step meetings went online. You know, we no longer took our ladies at the rehab to meetings because because of the COVID risk. And so we were every night, they were going on to meet different meetings online, even different locations. They would try one from the East Coast or try one from international. And um, it's really been amazing. I think, especially for people who are a little bit more shy or have some of that social anxiety, you know, to be able to be there on a Zoom um, or maybe not even necessarily have to have your camera on, but you're still there receiving, you know, and listening and stuff like that can be. If that's an option, I think that could be really, really helpful for some folks. 
Well, the other part of it is that sometimes people don't really want to share with people in their local community, right? Either for professional reasons or let's be, be honest, sometimes there's a gossipy side to meetings, right? Where things get shared outside the rooms that shouldn't. So when people participate online, they're usually not, it's not just people in their local community. These people are truly strangers and, and you can keep your information more private. You can be more anonymous sometimes in a way by yes, doing it yes. online. But there's also a tremendous value of in-person. I mean, I think this debate is going on right now in the treatment world where, you know, even as a psychologist, right, a ton of my peers gave up their offices during the pandemic and now are working exclusively remotely and some clients are not into that you know clients i hear a lot of new clients who are looking for therapy they're like i really want to meet with someone in person it's so much more meaningful to me to be in the same room with someone than to be you know across a screen it just feels really disconnected for some folks so now we've had kind of a resurgence in within person and and taking our clients back to in-person meetings and things and they really seem to love that too well and that's one reason why it can be important to know that you don't have to commit exclusively so for example i think about half of she recovers members also belong to 12 steps and and of course she recovers is fine with that because it's their you know their program right and and life rings similarly some of our members do um they do 12 steps for the face-to-face -face connection, but they base their philosophy and their program around the life ring approach. So they get to have that combination of meeting people in their local community, but also um, doing uh, basing their recovery on a on a program that's more um, comfortable for them, more consistent with yeah. The way and they aren't do some of these programs too? I know there's certainly specific uh, harm reduction groups, but isn't there also a little bit of a differing philosophy kind of across programs around? harm reduction versus total abstinence. And can we even talk about what that is? People might not even know. Well, She Recovers is not specifically abstinence, although you know the majority of the women are abstinence. It really is about you defining what recovery means to you. And then, as I mentioned, for life ring, being on a medication assisted treatment is considered sober, which isn't true for some, some other programs. Um, and of course, being on other medications as well. SMART is no longer 100% abstinence based either. The other thing is, like, it, it can also be um, a little more nuanced. So, for example, in life ring, although we are abstinent, uh, abstinence based we understand that people usually don't walk in the room on day one 100 percent committed to abstinence and so we want our newcomers to be able to have um to to have to be able to be honest about where they are in that process and have a conversation about it rather than having to pretend they're further along in that journey than they really are which can happen sometimes in other meetings and so we encourage them to talk about you know the natural ambivalence that most of us have in early recovery, right? It's okay to have that conversation. One day I'm 100% committed and the next day I think maybe I can have a beer or whatever right. it might be. Right. And so you're right, there's variations on how abstinence-based or how strictly abstinent the different programs are. Yeah, and I think people too also have a misperception kind of in the general public that once you decide to get sober, that's it, you know? <laughs> like, and, and I wish it was that easy, um, but for many people it isn't. And relapse can be a very common part of the recovery process. And we try not to look at it through this negative lens of, oh, I'm bad. I have failed. You know, let me beat myself up and riddle myself with shame. It's more like, okay, no, let's get back on the horse. You fell off. Let's get back on. And what can you learn from this, right? Or, or what needs to be different? Um, what were you not addressing before? Maybe unresolved trauma, right? that's impacting you still. Um, I think sometimes people, especially uh, loved ones or people who don't know much about the recovery process, maybe don't understand that a relapse can be considered something normal that many people, especially in early recovery, struggle with. Yeah, I mean, I used three times in my first five months, you know, and, and that was way better, right? If I could have used three times in five months on a regular basis, I would have been in rehab. You know? So it was it was a big step forward. And then mm -hmm. I got 29 years. And I do when I talk to friends and family, which I do a lot, I talk to I tell them that and I talk to them how I when I walked in the rooms, I didn't actually even think I could get sober. Like it was beyond my imagination. It wasn't that I wanted to keep using. It was just, it, I didn't think it was possible. And it take, took me time to really start to see that as a goal 
that was on the table for me, that if I did the work, it might be an outcome that I could actually attain. And so I do talk, especially with friends and family about that ambivalence is normal, um, not being able to be perfectly sober from the beginning is normal. And I encourage them to look at patterns. Like you say, if there's a slip, does the person um, do an analysis to think about what exactly happened? And you know, what am I gonna do when that situation arises next time? Or what do I need to add into my program to strengthen it so that I'm not uh, I'm a lower risk of, of having a relapse? And all those things are what should be focused on, not just um, not the understandable fear. It's the fear is understandable, but you can't let that drive the process. It's much more important to do the um, the review that you were talking about. Exactly, and this is what we you know work with our clients in treatment on as well. Is is yes, um, the chain analysis or whatever it is, the relapse autopsy is often what it's called, which is a terrible name for it, but it is, it's like dissecting, you know, how did this lead to this yeah. lead to this? And yeah, what was missing and what needs to be different, you know? And, and I have to say in the treatment field, we have frequent flyers. We just have, we have clients that are on a regular basis, you know, do well for a while, have a pretty major relapse, come back to treatment. That's normal as well. You know, like we don't, um, again, we don't judge people or make them wrong if their, if their journey requires multiple treatment stays, but we do ask what's going to be different this time. What were you not willing to do before? Um, and a lot of times it is the fellowship piece. It's, I, I don't like those meetings. I don't want to go. And so that tends to fuel the isolation. And we know that isolation, especially for women, you know, who are very socially and emotionally, you know, connection is so important for us. Um, I think that isolation and the depression and shame and stuff that comes with it can be a huge relapse trigger for a lot of folks. So fellowship sometimes is the one that's overlooked. Well, the other thing I encourage people to do is to look at the larger pattern too, because a lot of times what will happen is that the relapses get shorter and shorter and, it's, and the sober time in between gets longer and longer. It's sort of like you're sort of building your ability to be able to um, stay sober for a longer period of time. It's, it's a, it's a step up process. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a leap forward. And so sometimes it can be helpful to look at the bigger picture. I, I mean, some, like it, sometimes in She Recovers, people talk about, well, I've been sober for six years minus 18 days or something, because, you know, it's really about, you know, the whole yeah. time period. And what skills do you have? Um, I, I think it's also good to get away from that idea of going back to day zero, because I don't think we ever go back to day zero. Even if we weren't able to maintain perfect abstinence, we had learned something that allowed us to get some sobriety time. We had done some work. We had some skills. We had some increased knowledge that we could now apply. And so I really discourage newbies when they talk about, I'm back to day zero. That can be so disheartening and you know and debilitating when really you're never back there. You're always starting from um, from this same point going forward, even if you had that slip. Yes, exactly. All that time clean is not lost just because there was a slip or number changes yes. or whatever it is, right? Like we really, I just love the strengths-based, more empowerment approaches. You know, I work a lot with, uh, the audience knows that I'm involved with Conscious Recovery, which is a wonderful book. And uh, together, TJ Woodward and I co-authored the workbook. And um, what we do that's different in this approach is, you know, we talk about addiction as a brilliant strategy. We don't use those pathologizing labels. I'm an addict or I'm bipolar. Or I'm, you know, I have a condition. I have um, maybe a disorder, but I am not that. And I think that's so important to, uh, I am more than just this behavior. I am more than just this addiction or this mental health diagnosis. And I love the introduction you gave. Um, was it women for recovery or women for sobriety? Right? Is that the one where they you introduce yourself as, yes. as, as basically an empowered woman? I love that. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. And and I will say part of the part of the reason I called my book from Junkie to Judge, and, and by the way, I would never use Junkie for someone else, but I really wanted to own this shooting meth part of my history. Um, because I feel like like when I see on people on television who are shooting meth, they're almost presented as like beyond our understanding, you know, that they're so far gone that they don't deserve our empathy or they don't deserve our help. And I really wanted to sort of connect myself to, to the uh, intravenous user. 
But also by saying junk and judge, to me, it's shorthand by saying, you know, where we are when we're using and what we can be in our recovery are not really connected. We need to understand that even the person you're looking at who is struggling the hardest, who, you know, who may be homeless and in the streets and shooting drugs, that person deserves our help. And that person can be a happy and productive member of society if we give that Yes, help. and it's so important. I think this is the other value in these support groups is that you get to hear from those folks like yourself, right? Who it's like, hey, I've been where you've been and I was able to get out of it and look at the life I've created. I think that is so important for people to know that it's possible and to have that inspiration um, and to have hope, right? That it's possible and even maybe guidance. I know some of the programs have you know, various kinds of mentorship, right? With folks um, in the AA program, it's sponsor, you know, someone who has more sobriety helps someone who's more of a newcomer. I think being able to have all of that as part of these support groups is so important. Yeah, I mean, I found that 12 steps wasn't a good fit for me, but in the beginning, I found the shares to be useful. Over time, I found them repetitive, but in the beginning, it was helpful for me to hear people tell their story and they were, they had been where I was and now I could see that they were doing well. And, and I will say, and I also do emphasize the judge thing. I use that, um, that judge title as sort of a, I just used to get people's ears open because the truth is that was my job. It's not the most important part of my recovery. I mean, I'm proud of it. It was an accomplishment, but the joy of recovery is the lack of chaos and the lack of obsession and being able to be a good wife and aunt and, you know, and be productive and be useful and, uh, and, and and enjoy life. These are all the most important parts of recovery. The, you know, a job, it's nice. These are accomplishments, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I just still really appreciate just the, that I can use my mental and emotional energy in some pla in other places besides just that spinning, spinning, spinning of my drug use and also yeah. of my PTSD. Um, I don't know how far we want to go down this track, but I figure I'll ask you anyways, um, since you have worked in the legal field, um, how do you think the, the interface, I mean, this is a broad question, but like this interface between the criminal justice system and addiction in our country, where often, you know, we, the legal system has taken a more punitive approach, right. To people with addiction issues. Um, and then we had the advent of drug courts and, you know, a lot of that change. How do you feel like we're doing now with that whole, uh, connection between the legal system and addiction treatment and addiction in general? I mean, not well, right? I mean, you know, for, for personally, I support decriminalization of personal use for multiple reasons. Um, for one thing, I, I, I feel, you know, on one hand, even the federal government acknowledges that substance use disorder is a medical condition, and yet they criminalize it. Well, that's a contradiction. Um, the the other reality is that if someone doesn't have a substance use disorder and their their personal use of drugs and it's not hurting anyone anyone else, why do I care? <laughs> I don't care, um, but it's also because the, the war on drugs has destroyed so many lives. I mean, you know, there's everyone that gets caught up in it. You have um, long-term consequences on your ability to get work, how much you're gonna earn. It can have housing consequences, federal benefit consequences, educational consequences, on top of which we have a radical racial disparity in the way that we enforce uh, our drug laws. And in, so that's um, that injustice in and of itself to me undermines it. And drug courts are really um, variable ac across the country. I mean, a lot of people are forced into treatment when they don't actually have a substance use disorder. They just got arrested. So they're taking up, we don't have enough beds for the people who want treatment. And we're just taking up a lot of beds with people who don't actually need it or they don't need to be inpatient, right? Not everyone with a mild right. SUD needs to go right. inpatient. Um, and then also a lot of the, the drug courts aren't putting people in evidence-based treatment. And so they're putting them, they don't even understand, a lot of the judges don't really fully understand what is evidence-based treatment or what the science is telling us at this point. So don't get me wrong, I would rather be, you know, in drug court than in prison, but that doesn't mean drug court is a really um, a healthy or effective alternative. There are better ways, including, you know, let's develop a system in America of treatment on demand, readily accessible, affordable treatment for substance use disorder. We right. don't have that. Right. Yet. We have a long ways to go, I think, on a societal yes. level. I mean, I live in San Francisco, so, you know, enough said there with the whole 
drug homeless population and what what we're struggling with in our city it's kind of destroying our city and our government hasn't really responded well you know they've they've tried different things and nothing's really worked california has about uh i believe about a third of the homeless population in the whole country lives in california because you know we have weather and various things that you know attract them here but it's a real it's a real problem i guess what i would like to ask you you know as we start to wind this down is like what would you like to see the future you know if you could i often ask this you know for for on mental on the mental health side but let's ask it on the addiction side and if you look at the whole system and everything what would you like to see happen in in the coming years to really help people get the treatment and a care that they need well, I mean, if we decriminalize personal use in particular, right, we can take that money and put it into treatment because it costs three to four times as much to incarcerate someone as it does to treat someone. So we would free up a lot of funds and maybe we could actually get much closer to having, you know, treatment on demand, which is what we really need to have. Um, and then also people's lives won't be destroyed in that same way, right? So we're not going to be putting those handicaps, those obstacles in people's paths, and that's going to be better. And then, as you say, if we can have a, a better um, uh, connection between mental health treatment and substance use treatment, that's going to be better for all of us. And then sometimes people ask me, what's the one thing we could do to reduce our substance use disorder rate, which by the way, America has one of the highest rates yep. in the world. <laughs> um, and the thing that I always say, if we were to do one thing for me, it's mental health treatment for children, because I think that's really the source of a lot of the problems. Yep. Spot on. I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you. Um, this has been such a wonderful conversation, Mary Beth. If people want to find out more about um, your book or, or the different programs we've talked about, like what would you suggest? Where can they go? So my, Sure. So the book is, the full title is From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. And it's on Amazon and all the usual sites and your bookstores to have it or can get it. My website is junkietojudge.com and like my op-eds that you mentioned are there, some uh, other uh, items. And you can also email a message me through my website and I answer all messages. Um, on my Twitter is at Mary Bethel underscore. And I actually use my Twitter account to provide information. It's mostly I cite articles, um, new, new, new studies that come out. And then, you know, some of my ideas about recovery uh, and then, um, life ring is lifering.org. You know, she recovers is she recovers.org women for sobriety. Those are all available, easily, uh, found on the internet today. Yay for the internet. You don't have to go to the library. So <laughs> card catalog. Remember you used to have the action, to, like right. look through all these like drawers of little index cards. Yes. Back in the day. <laughs> yes. We live in, in amazing times, um, uh, in many, many different ways. Um, and thank you so much for being a guest today. Any final thoughts you want to leave the audience with? I mean, I do just want to, you know, be a sign of encouragement, right? I mean, I grew up in a physically and sexually abusive household. I actually had two multi-assailant rapes. I lived with a violent boyfriend for a while. And I, and I had a substance problem from 17 until 32. And yet I recovered, not just from the substances, but really from the trauma to the point that I'm able to enjoy my life and be generally happy and, and not live in that, in that, you know, stress filled, anxiety filled world. And so I just, I just hope that anyone who's struggling, especially in, with any combination of those things, um, can really start to have the hope that you mentioned that there is a way out and there is a way forward. Thank you so much for sharing with us your experience and all of your knowledge. And, um, I'm so grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the audience who's tuned in today. And as you know, the more you, click like and share and comment and rate the podcast, the more people will get this information. So please do those things. And uh, thanks for tuning in today. And we'll see you next time on Kaleidoscope of Possibilities. Bye everyone. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. This has been Dr. Adriana Popescu. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share with others. To find out more about me, my guests, and more, please visit my website at adrianapopescu.org. See you next time.